very much for joining us. This is a special session. Uh, it's a bonus session for the Packaging Summit, the Virtual Packaging Summit, and it is also a podcast because uh, we don't normally do this, but we've actually brought together two manufacturers who manufacture curing systems to talk a little bit about the whole issues around curing, a little bit about sustainability, about kind of energy costs, a little bit about kind of the, the importance of, of thinking about the technology before you kind of go all the way to developing a piece of tech, a piece of kit. Um, so I just introduce you to both of these uh, to my colleagues today. Uh, I've got Rob Carston from Fosian. Hi, Rob. Hi, Mark uh, Fraser. Sorry, you're not Marcus. You're Fraser. No, I, yeah, it does happen. It does happen. I often get called Marcus. And Dave Johnson of Integration Technology. Hi, Dave. Hi, Fraser. How are you? I'm good. I'm very good. And we were, we were just saying, weren't we, that you're about to fly off to Mauritius. So uh, we've just caught you before you get on a plane, which is... Uh... Yeah, I won't be quite so pasty, I hope, in a week or so. <laughs> exactly yeah. that. Lucky Gentlemen, you. Just because this is a, a kind of conversation and a bit of a chat, tell me first, Rob, just do a quick intro for yourself, uh, who you are, and briefly who Fosian are. Okay, yeah. Um, so a lot of you will know me, but I'm uh, Rob Carson. Yeah, I was, I was born in northern British Columbia and have been living in, uh, in the UK since 1984. I've uh, been in various industries, mainly electronics, consultancies, and things like that. And then uh, back in 2004, through uh, a mute, uh, through a, a contact of mine, I got introduced to Fosion, and they they'd want that this uh, idea of a uh, UV replacing conventional uh, UV systems using mercury and things like that with LEDs, and it sounded interesting to me. It kind of appealed to my kind of uh, consciousness, and uh, so I was given the task of setting up the company back then uh, here in Europe, and uh, I've really been involved ever since, and you know we've been evangelizing and, and, and pushing the UV LED agenda for, for, for many, many, many years now. Uh, and, it, you know, we met, uh, we had some initial disasters at the beginning. Uh, it was very funny, actually, one of the first things that we were actually going to, our, our big success story in, in LED technology was going to be in CD printing. Mm -hmm. And you know, that, that all, I mean, literally, I mean, about six months after we decided that the whole industry just almost <laughs> yeah. disappeared overnight. And so that yeah. was, uh, that was really a bit worrying. But, uh, but the, the interesting thing was, is that in parallel to that, we kind of started to learn a little bit about inkjet printing, and which was also kind of transitioning into CD printing. And and that's kind of how one thing kind of led to another and, and uh, how, we, how we first started to get involved with, uh, yeah. with the whole inkjet industry. So, yeah. yeah so. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Dave, do you want yeah. to just give us a quick intro of yourself and integration technology? Yeah, sure. So uh, I've been in the uh, UV industry since 1988. Uh, I left the Navy where I did my apprenticeship um, and worked for my father for a year, which didn't work out on the usual family issues and uh, decided that I ought to go and find a real job. So I joined a company called Wallace Knight in those days who were making UV systems um, for mostly for sheet paper presses and uh, web web uh, offset and uh, flexo machines. Um, I stayed there and I've, I've been in the industry ever since. Um, uh, I joined Integration Technology when a year after it was formed in 2000. And we specifically were going to go after the digital inkjet market. As Rob was saying, it was uh, just starting to need a UV system. Mm -hmm. LED wasn't around in 2001. And um, so we, we manufactured specifically a UV medium pressure mercury arc lamp system for doing digital for, for fitting to digital presses wide format presses that uh, uh scan backwards and forwards sure. um and we did very well we were we've supplied um at the time we were supplying zunt and and then nur uh and after that we supplied uh, color span so we did really well with the with the lamp systems but we also recognized quite early on that led was going to be the coming uh, technology so we started developing in about 2003 our led offerings and the rest as they say is history we've been you know delivering systems since then and um we, we got a bit of knowledge the same as Fosion have um and we think that you know we can share this yeah and i guess um like the industry the you know the digital print industry particularly 
there's been an evolution of uh, going from analog to digital technology and the different applications then lend itself to certain different curing systems. Um, so, so Rob, just kind of take us on that, that evolution, if that makes sense, from, from where it was to where it is and what the other alternatives are. So, you know, if someone's out there thinking about curing, what mm-hmm. do they look for? What are the key issues? Just take us on that path. You know, I think one of the the initial, you know, the huge the benefits really for initially for for LED technology over the existing technologies is largely one of um, it just user friendliness. So you were able to, you know, switch the it systems on and off digitally, so they were ready when you wanted them. There was little or no heat. They were very compact. Uh, they, you know, their energy saving. Uh, and they had extremely long life and reliability. So there was very little maintenance or uh, any intervention with the light source involved. And they could be air cooled, they could be water cooled, depending on what you wanted. So it, and, and that was for the digital industry. And I, the digital industry was really one of the first industries to really embrace the technology. Mm-hmm. And, and I think David probably agree with me now. I mean, there's hardly a printer that goes out nowadays that isn't LED. Mm-hmm. And they're virtually all LED now. And I mm-hmm. think you know, between us, we've been very successful in converting that market to, to LED technology. And, and as that's moved on, other industries have also begun to embrace LED technology. And, and so whether it's in, in coatings and other print formats, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, there, the LED technology has become ubiquitous as the curing uh, you know, the preferred choice for curing. Yeah. And I guess that's now against other options, which would have been what, warm air, fan, what, you know, tell me what the other options were. Sure, yeah, you you had, um, it, I think it depends where you are in the world, but certainly in Europe, UV, conventional UV technologies, I would call it. So, you know, with mercury type bulbs, yep. that, that was the, you know, the, the dominant technology. Uh, but you also have a lot of hot air, NIR, IR, uh, you know, technologies that were out there as well. But where we were really looking to compete was against the conventional UV technologies. Mm. And that's where really, uh, you know, where where we wanted to um, make our mark. And and that's where we, you know, we were largely successful in, yeah. in making yeah. changes yeah. in that industry. Dave, any comment on that? I guess a similar path for integration technology? Yeah, quite similar indeed. Um, I would say that um, digital was ripe for picking up uh, the UV LED technology as well. It's a new industry, new industry to print. It's a new way of doing things, and they were much more open to a new way of of curing. And um, particularly with a digital machine, usually you you just need one lamp or maybe one lamp and some pinning. Whereas with a conventional printing machine, you might need eight colours. You might need eight. UV systems. Yeah. So new technology, new new technology tends to be more expensive. And if you've only got one head to put on a machine, it's a much bigger, or sorry, much smaller investment and risk than sticking, for argument's sake, eight on a machine. Mm. So it was it was absolutely right for digital to go for it. They they accepted it without going really to conventional curing. So it became it moved straight in as the way to do things. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas when you're into an existing industry, you're obviously trying to convert people. You know, well, we've we've always done it this way. Why sure. why would we change? And they're always looking for the barriers, if you yeah, like. The reason not to change. Mm-hmm. In some ways, you're right. I think you're right. I mean, let's face it, UV in general is for, for the most part and even on a conventional system is is a good way of curing is a, is a sustainable energy efficient way of curing hmm. and uv led takes that to the next level right mm-hmm. yeah. so you know if you've got lots of big ir dryers on a machine that's yeah. an ex or an oven or yeah, uh, i worked saying. for a while in metal printing in a previous yeah. company and you, you apart from the fact you've got a 30 or a 50 meter oven gas-fired mm. oven mm. that's driving off horrible solvents into the atmosphere yeah. so then they put an afterburner on consumes even more energy yeah forget all the energy saving it's yeah. 30 or 50 meters of floor space that you're saving yeah but but as you said you know in 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 modern day thinking clearly sustainability is important clearly energy use 
for it's not only a commercial importance but also uh, sustainability importance so i mean this just kind of throws uv led to the fore even more doesn't it really yeah i mean you know if one of the things that we're very active in at the moment is looking at uh, changing the flexo industry over to uv led and we we reckon that there are something like 10,000 flexo presses within europe and and, and it won't happen, but if you were to convert all those to LED, you would save in, in the region of four to 500 million tons of CO2, somewhere yeah. in the region of, the equivalent is somewhere in the region of 10 million trees a year. Yeah. Mm. So it shows you the impact something like, you know, a conversion to LED technology can have. And, it, yeah. and it, it can play a really important part in people achieving their sustainability targets. Yeah. Yeah, and and just going back to that point, but so so I'm sure some analog traditional printing uh, routes are are where the opportunity lies to to shift them. Well, why is it just sort of resistance to change, or is it the systems are set up? What's what's causing it to be a problem for you to persuade them to take UV LED? Dave? Ink pricing, for instance, cost of the consumables. Um, the ink companies will inevitably charge a premium for a uv ink i've yeah. spoken to several different ink technologists and they are telling me and i'm sure rob will agree with this they're telling me that the base components are the same components slightly yeah. different mm -hmm. um but you've got an r d cost which yep. they will obviously want to recoup and mm -hmm. let's face it if you can make a profit selling a, a conventional sorry conventional uv ink forever in a day you've got no r d cost going in there you are just making your margin every yeah. week yeah you've got the, the it's, it's predictable it's it's you know if you're risk averse it's a nice safe way of going mm. um what i was going to do actually just while i've got the floor for a second if you like mm -hmm. is i was going to reinforce on a smaller scale something that rob um said we had a customer in north america that went from using uh, a microwave uh uv uh system to using a uv led system mm -hmm. to do their curing Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, obviously Rob's a competitor of mine, so I'm not going to say exactly who it is, <laughs> but they had a number of, uh, they had a number of lines to convert mm -hmm. and they got the electricity company to give them a grant to reduce their power, which is kind of a bit of a, an oxymoron. Why mm -hmm. would a, uh, anyway, it's mm -hmm. the way things happen sometimes in, in, with our North American friends. And, um, they they budgeted for about a 60% power saving by changing to UV, and that's mm. how they got their grant. Mm. And they went back and crunched the numbers afterwards. They were saving over 80% mm. their electricity costs. Mm. And just on that alone, they had an ROI of something like six months per line. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it can make a massive difference if your profits are relatively small, your margins are small, then it's, this cost saving becomes effectively your profit or potentially your profit, doesn't it? Oh, no, I mean, I, I could do, you know, like Dave, you know, we have, I don't know how many different times people have, you know, been overwhelmed by how successful the conversion to, to LED has been. And, mm. and, and the savings, you know, we're often, I, I think, you know, we understate the savings. We saw it's like 50%. It's more like 70, 80, and in some cases, over 90%. Sure. Energy savings. I mean, we're, we're looking at one company at the moment where we will save them 80%. So if you look at the, the, the printing lines in their factory, they, uh, they use over a third to 40% of the entire factory electrical costs are on driving those machines. Mm. And we'll save them at least 80% of that, mm. 40%. So mm -hmm. it's a huge impact. Yeah, yeah, sure. Just, um, just going along the lines of um, thinking a little bit about the packaging industry, because we, we talked about, you know, different segments, different application marketplaces. Obviously, packaging is is one of those traditional markets. There's a lot of analog technology, but equally, there's a, there's a drive for, towards digital. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested a little bit in the kind of, you know, the issues, particularly with food packaging, uh, of curing, and of water-based and UV, you know, t t talk me through, let's start with Dave. Dave, talk me through, you know, where you're at on, on, on that side of things. 
Okay, so food packaging and the people who are printing food packaging are even more risk averse than some of the other people. <laughs> um, so the first thing you've got to do is overcome that. Yeah. Um, then, then you start getting into the realms of well, UV. Now we need to think about low migration. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. things like that. Mm. And and clearly they are not as advanced as the other inks. Mm. However, there are digital low migration inks that are available that will be cured by or can be cured by UV LED. Yep. Um, but you have to go and look for it, and someone's got to dip their toe and start doing it because, yeah, sure. you know, the first adopters will will you know, inevitably bear the brunt of the costs, if you like, the initial yeah. costs. But they'll lead the way, won't they? Precisely. Mm. And, um, you know, and we've had a few customers uh, who are doing food packaging, and they've, you know, they complain about the cost of the ink initially or the right. consumables initially, but very quickly that kind of goes quiet and mm. then they then they're more accepting of the technology because sure. they may be saving it elsewhere maybe the uh, you know because they've got continued or continued supply or demand uh, that the the prices tend to drop so i'm sure rob's got similar yeah yeah, yeah i just I mean, go on, you say thing rob. i would say Fraser, in and dave's spoken very much about the digital side of it but on the on the analog side uh. of LED curing for packaging. Uh, there are quite a few, uh, I think all the major suppliers now have LED curable versions. Right. Uh, mm. Some of the areas where people struggle are on uh, clear coats and things like that. Mm. They are available, but they tend to be quite a bit more expensive at the moment. Yeah. With a lot of the changes that are happening on, on, on the ROAS with materials and things, it looks like that some of the cheaper components are gonna disappear. Mm. But the cost of some of the base components will go up, which means that that, that gap will gap will reduce. So, and like like they've said as well, I mean these people are notoriously conservative. There have been a number of big scares that have gone on about migration, sure. and food packaging, which have been big <coughs> issues. Um, but equally, you know, it, at some level as well, the you know also we have our role to play as as the light source supplier. Uh, you know, the equipment suppliers have their role to play as well. And I had a very recent example where a we went to, to say the equipment suppliers are kind of neutral about what they're going to supply, right? And they say, yeah. well, we're not here to sell light systems. We're here to sell mm. printing presses, right? Mm. And, uh, and then we had a customer who we went to see as an end user because that's maybe a better way to influence the market for us. And they were really annoyed that they knew nothing about an LED system for their printing press and never been even offered one. Mm. They're going, they've seen their electricity costs go up by 150% this year. And they said if they'd known that there was an LED option for this process, they would have absolutely mm. gone for it. Mm. And then mm. what's happened now is that that press OEM yeah. is now in a very bad light with that customer. They're looking at buying another two presses now. Yeah. They don't yeah. want to talk to them. <laughs> on that sort, on that sort of note, it, it sounds to me as though you know your technology is part of a collaboration. Often, with, mm. to develop a piece of technology that, that delivers final product, and yeah. I may be wrong, but I guess that like you know, there's lots of elements going on in there. And and does UV get seen as a bit of an afterthought? Sometimes is it you know, the curing system is a bit of an afterthought? Dave, is that is that what happens? Absolutely. I mean, you, we're going to build a UV printer. Um, we're going to look at the printing end, yeah. and and oh, it's just a light source. It'll go on the sure. other end. And the, the I'm sure again, Rob's got the same <laughs> stories to tell. You know, where you turn up and they've left no space for the for the UV system. They haven't considered if it's digital, yeah. if they need pinning, whether it's intercolor drying or anything. There's all sorts of uh, reasons why and and to an extent i can understand the problem yeah. you know it is the last thing that actually happens after you've printed your ink varnish whatever it might be you cure it and so it naturally is the end thing uh -huh. but it does have to be an integral part of that um integration of a, a complete yeah. system and that conversation isn't it let's be honest if they're yeah. building a piece of technology to deliver something then they need to think of all parts before they you know go to start push the button to to start the build type of thing i mean that's that's you know i've heard the similar comments from the ink manufacturers who often say the ink always gets forgotten you know they build a piece of te technology first and then they go oh 
we need to think about the ink and then it might take a year, a year and a half, whatever, to develop the ink to, yeah. to, to work. So I, I think there's lots of elements in there. We've, you know, we've talked a lot of future print about collaboration and trying to get everyone to work together because a lot of the, you know, particularly in inkjet, there's a lot of bespoke technology built to provide a solution. So, you know, I'd, I'd be behind everything you said, Rob, I guess you're, you're, well, would argue the, the same, would you? Sorry, go on. Dave. Sorry. Uh, sorry, Rob. I hope I'm speaking for you All as right. well here. And that is that, um, it's an interesting concept, the conversations you have sometimes. So the first thing is, so say you're an ink supplier, quite often I'll be under an NDA, which means I can't talk to you about what I'm doing. And the same for uh, uh, a printing machine manufacturer. Um, so you, you you end up in this situation where you know fine well, well, Fraser's supplying the ink, but I can't mention this to him. Yeah. So we end up dancing around our handbags um, because we're trying to give information and get information without without breaching our NDA. Sure. And actually, my concern is if, if you're the machine manufacturer and, and, and Rob's my competition, what I don't want you to do is supply the information that I give you directly to Rob because that's not fair and I wouldn't yeah. expect Rob's information to be given yeah, yeah. to me. Um, but I have to trust you because you've got competitive people in there, mm. but you don't trust me. Yeah, I guess you're asking for a more open relationship with your with the suppliers. That we're that, all under NDA. Yeah, make yeah. it a trilateral, yeah. bilateral, whatever yeah, yeah, you yeah. need to do. Well, just make, make sense, it, it make it a conversation sense. because we we actually have come across a lot of the things before, and we can go. Hmm, you might not want to do that. Yeah, yeah. Rob, I think you know, that's where we we see the the best success is where we've been working with companies for many years, and mm. things just flow. They understand our technology. They, they call on us for our expertise and knowledge. You know, we've been doing this for a very long time. So like they've mm. said, you know, we've come across so many different variants. We understand a, a lot more about the light dynamics and, and how all that works. And we have yeah. all the analytical tools at Fosion so we can look at light, you know, modeling and and, and all these things. And and so they, they use us as, an, a, as, their, as their expertise in this sure. area. And, sure. and consultancy in that. Yeah, and the longer we've been working together, the better it gets. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Um, I just want to, we're kind of coming to the end. I just want to pick up on one thing that's often mentioned is there's a sort of comparison between, should we say, cheaper Chinese products. I'm not, you know, they don't have to come from China, but they could come from Asia and and maybe some more traditional manufacturers like yourselves. You know, if you're talking to someone who's looking at the technology and looks at one product versus another product, what should what should you be looking for? Well, I mean, the one thing I'd always be concerned is 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 you know after sales service support, yeah, uh, and and depth of experience. So people can claim all kinds of things, but if they have a very short history in terms of manufacturing things, they they won't have the know how, the experience, and and all the pitfalls. I mean, I see light sources. From people and look at it and i can tell it that ain't gonna work mm -hmm. <laughs> right mm -hmm. it looks all right but i know it's not going to work because i know what the problems are going to be because we've been doing them for like 15 20 years right mm -hmm. and, and this is the issue uh, and you know you need people that you can rely on and support i mean the big oems that we work with you know they can't afford to have machines going down all over the world Sure, uh, sure. And, and having to fly people everywhere, and especially nowadays when you can mm -hmm. hardly get anyone anywhere. Dave, would you tend to agree? Absolutely. I mean, I'll give you an analogy. If you put a, a, an engine in a car and you go and run it at 6,000 RPM all day long and you don't care about the cooling and you don't change the filters and the oil and all the rest of it, it breaks. Mm. Well, that's kind of the same thing with with a with a UV system and a UV mm. LED system. Mm. You need to be you need to be looking at this that you want it to run for many years. And frankly, a good quality UV LED system will outlast most of the printing machines. Oh, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, just the, the only other thing that I occasionally hear is some people, particularly when they're building a piece of technology, will try and produce their own light source or, or curing system. And and how do you view that? I mean, that's I I guess you would argue a case to say, well, you know, you've got all that you, you specialize in curing. They're trying to build something just to fit in. So so, what's your comment towards these guys? Well, I think if they're going to do it as a one-off, it's a low-powered, simple little solution, and and cost is the only objective. Mm. Then 
then you know I, I would say okay fine get on with it but if yeah. you want you know a proper industrial piece of equipment it's got all the ce it's got the ul it's got uh, emc tested it's going to be quality control manufactured it's going to be built in a clean room uh, you know it's going to be built with with reliability with monotonous regularity and and supply to then you know it takes more than just throwing a couple of leds onto a pcb uh, yeah. you know, and of course you can do that but that's not going to be a high powered industrialized piece of equipment yeah and i guess you get what you pay for don't you really in a way you know if you do it yourself you know yeah. the risk is the risk is there dave did any any final comment on that no, well no except i agree with rob totally yeah. um you know, we spend a lot of time resourcing our components, testing them, yeah. and you can do it on a one-off basis. You yeah. absolutely can. But then you try and get the second one to be the same and the mm. third one and the fourth one and the fifth mm. one. And then you start having problems. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's that repetition of product is, is probably a, a challenge for them if they're building more than one. So, yeah, and yeah, then also, think... you know, where are they going to get, you know, they often don't have the resource and the time and the energy to, to continue that development. Yeah, yeah, so they make yeah. one and then, okay, what's the next generation? What's the next generation? Sure. And who's going to invest in that? And, you know, and, and they don't. Generally. Yeah, no, absolutely. Gentlemen, um, we've come to the end of our, our kind of 30 minutes or so. Uh, thank you very much. I don't imagine you, you know, it, it, went quite quickly for me personally um ho hopefully it was interesting to to the listeners and to the people viewing it um thank you to rob thank you to dave dave enjoy your, you, your time off yeah, yeah i'm gonna <laughs> do my best yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Oh, Send us right. a, let me practice margarita <laughs> please <laughs> exactly yes exactly <laughs> that gentlemen thank you very much to the both of you and um we'll put your contact details on the end of this video and uh spoke speak to you both soon Take care, Thank you, Fraser. Thank you very much. Thank you.